Before I get into the video, I just want to remind you to like and subscribe and to find Tahoe Overlanding over on Instagram for additional content that isn't posted to YouTube. In this video, we're going to talk about the radius arms and how they were engineered and fabricated. Now, a radius arm design is not that unlike a three-link design. Both designs require the use of a pannered bar or also what uh, some people call a track bar. In fact, that's what I normally call it and um, does use a lower control arm just like a three link would use but instead of having that third link that ties over to the frame all the way back it uses two upper locating arms that tie back down to the lower control arm and those together combined make the radius arm now the benefit of a radius arm setup is that with the correct geometry a radius arm will always maintain the perfect pinion angle at the yoke of the pinion and why that's important is on a uh, CV style joint at the transfer case side, you do need to keep as close to a zero uh, driveline angle at the yoke on the pinion to avoid um, vibrations. So that is the reason why I went that route. Not only that, is it's very simple. Now, as I mentioned in my video five, that this axle is just so easy to use in the Chevys. It's almost like it was made for it. Well, you'll see that with the cross member fabricated and the axle mocked into place, you'll see that the radius arm slash lower control arm passes through the exact same pocket on the frame that the torsion bars did in the factory configuration. There's a nice little pocket in the frame. Everything clears it nicely. So, what I did is I took the axle and mocked it into place in the full upward stuffed position against the frame and engine. And that's how I measured the length of the radius arms. So I measured from bolt to bolt, the bolt on the uh, cross member at the frame side and the lower control arm mount on the axle, and then subtracted for the length of the joints and the threaded inserts, cut my two inch by quarter wall DOM tubing down and built the lower control arm section of the radius arm from there. Once that part was done, I was able to mock that in and set the pinion angle correctly. And that's how I then designed the upper locating arms. So I went from the upper control arm point of the axle back to the uh, point on the lower control arm where I welded on the mounts for the upper locating arm. Now those are just the same process again. Measure the uh, length from bolt to bolt, subtract for the joint and the threaded insert, but instead of using two inch tubing, uh, I just use one and a half inch by quarter wall tubing because those are mostly there to maintain caster angle. And, uh, you know, like when you step on the brakes, for example, the axle wants to roll forward and that is um, stopping the axle from doing that. So they don't need to be a full two inch tubing and makes them a little bit smaller, a little bit better clearance.
So what I did was get those all mocked in and built and welded up. From that point on, I already had the track bar uh, built because I built that first. Uh, you can see in my previous video where I uh, built the track bar and the steering. That way, with everything in, I had a fully functioning um, radius arm setup. Now, what I did was um, was able to measure the uh, flex of the front suspension. And from this picture, you can see that the uh, flex is far beyond what the spring will have length for at droop, uh, what a shock uh, would have length for. So I did need to use limit straps because this suspension does have the capability of far out flex um, what I currently am using it for. Now I was concerned at first that where the um, upper locating arm ties back to the lower control arm would uh, interfere with the frame, but as you can see with the bump stops fully installed that there is plenty of clearance between the upper locating arm and the frame. So uh, I was um, lucky to not have that be an issue, but uh, the upper control arm could technically um, go up a little bit further, but the axle housing itself is already about a quarter inch from touching the oil pan. So there's no way that I could really get much more travel. It does kind of travel more upward when I'm articulating side to side, and there is still quite a bit of clearance for that as well. So uh, I'm glad that that wasn't going to be an issue. That just made this radius arm setup even easier and more convenient to use. Uh, so if you were wanting to build your own, this setup would be capable for a lot more extreme of a design or a lot more extreme of a use than I'm using it for. But I do think that it's also a uh, very simple and easy and elegant way of doing it and it rides so much better than torsion bars ever did. So that is definitely an improvement on the, um, on the actual design. And with the limit straps, uh, just as a point of, uh, um, Point of information whenever you order limit straps make sure you order uh, some that are an inch shorter than uh, what your actual measurement is they stretch and so uh, I did make that mistake the first time and got some that were the exact length I needed but they stretched and were just a little loose so I had to get some that were an inch shorter but other than that uh, limit straps are always a good idea to uh, protect your shocks because instead of having your shock be your limiting factor the limit strap is what stops the axle from drooping out and that makes your shocks last a lot longer as well Plus my shocks are uh, long enough that they droop far more than the spring would allow also. So no matter what, shocks weren't really an option for me anyway to use to limit the axle downward travel. Always remember that friends don't let friends swap in leaf springs, especially as you've seen in this video and past videos, how easily a person can use coil springs and link setups and far outperform the uh, leaf springs and be far more comfortable of a ride even on road than a leaf spring can provide you.